Welcome to Fireside Chats with Brad. So glad to, uh, for you to join us today on the broadcast as we talk about a really critical issue called social justice. Now, many of you may have that on your mind after what you've seen in the news uh, with some certain events around our country, or maybe the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed some areas where mercy and compassion has needed. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And over the last couple of months, we've tried to uh, bring content to you that is inspiring and helpful and beneficial as you kind of scroll through your Facebook feed or, or YouTube channel. Um, we wanted to inject uh, a conversation into our culture, into our society that will be for the good of our neighbors. So I, I would love if you would share this video. Today's conversation, I think, is going to be uh, enlightening, encouraging, uh, but also really helpful around uh, this issue of social justice. So if you're on Facebook, feel free to share that with your friends. Uh, same with YouTube as well. So let's get right to it. I'm excited to bring on a special guest today. Uh, Kristen Miller of Tennessee Kids Belong and several other organizations is joining me. Kristen, welcome to Fireside Chats. Thanks for having me. So Kristen, uh, one of the you know real inspirations for today's conversation came out of the fact that you and I were recently teaching together and we we're talking about the issue of justice and what it looks like specifically for Christians to build a worldview and um, a biblical framework for what justice is. Uh, the scriptures called a faithfulness in it. Um, but in that, you shared a little bit of your own story in this journey. So for those who might not know you well, why don't you take just a few moments, share with us uh, your own journey, because uh, uh, you're really dialed into caring for vulnerable children in our, communi uh, in our community uh, and really beyond. And that's a slice of the pie when it comes to pursuing justice. But so just introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your passion and your story. Yeah. It's fun to think back of when it all started because it's so much of my world now. But in high school, our school invited us to take different mission trips depending on the language that we took. And so I was in Spanish. And so my junior and senior year of high school, I got to go to Tijuana, Mexico and serve in some different orphanages down there. And that was probably my first exposure with vulnerable kids. And my parents, my mom and my stepdad adopted three siblings from Guatemala when I was a senior in high school and then a freshman in college. And so that kind of continued that. And then throughout college, I got to take multiple international mission trips through my nursing program and do some medical missions. And I always kind of came back to the kids every single time um, and, and loved them. And then when I got into my master's program, I moved from home um, to Nashville and I was one of nine kids. And so leaving here and then going to be newly married where I knew no one. I was like, I need people. And so I reached out to two women in Nashville who were leading an organization um, that was benefiting children in Uganda and Haiti and Honduras at the time. And they had nine kids among them. Um, and so I got to, well, actually, maybe more than that. I think one had six and one had seven at the time. But I got to spend a lot of time um, when I wasn't studying babysitting their kids. Um, and a significant amount of them had different special needs. And so I felt like that kind of gave us the bravery and the courage to pursue um, adoption six months into our marriage, which I don't recommend to, uh, to everyone, but went on a medical mission trip to Ghana um, in late 2010 and met our girls um, and fell in love with them. And so started the two year long process of bringing them into our home. And so that brought it a lot closer on a daily basis working um, with vulnerable kids. And since then have really gotten to plug into Knoxville um, through fellowship and through the Chosen Children Initiative with getting to mentor and advocate for our foster and adoptive families, not only in our church, but kind of across our city through CAFCAM. Um, and out of all of that work, I was approached to walk away mostly from my job as a nurse practitioner um, to do full-time advocacy for foster care in East Tennessee and really across the state through Tennessee Kids Belong. Well, um, the, the way I got to know you, Kristen, was probably because of your adoption story. Uh, Kristen and Jeremy 
uh, have adopted children who were born in Africa, and so do uh, my wife, Julie, and I. And the Chosen Children and CAFGAM were such incredible resources. So if you're a Knoxville native and you're not aware of CAFGAM, that's the Knoxville Area Foster Care and Adoption uh, Ministry, man, great organization. We'll make sure we add the link to that in the notes and probably come back to it again later. But Kristen, your uh, journey, your story has inspired so many people. And it's one of the reasons Tennessee kids belong, uh, tapped you on the shoulder. And so you, you were a great teaching partner uh, this past weekend when we just talked about what the biblical view of justice is. And so I'm going to start with the definition again. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. Matter of fact, if you wanted to go back and either listen to the podcast or watch the teaching that Kristen and I did, we'll provide the link for that in the comments uh, as well. But this was the definition we started with. What we said is, is, is we're, we're going to talk about justice, and we're going to talk about mercy and compassion in these different spheres, that we need to begin with the right foundation, that it needs to be kind of shaped and formed by the gospel and through a worldview that is about bringing redemption and restoration. And so here was the definition we landed on that we taught through this past Sunday, that biblical justice, a, a, a Christian framed view of justice is this. It's the God glorifying and gospel fueled pursuit of righteous wholeness in the world. And so Kristen helped unpack each aspect of that. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, to go back and take 30 minutes to listen as we kind of lay the foundation. But when we got to the end of the talk, we addressed probably the most frequent question that I hear on this subject. Usually, here's what happens. People go to a concert, and maybe uh, uh, there's some sort of demonstration or a platform, an opportunity to sponsor a kid who's in need. Uh, or you see a commercial. Maybe your church has you know, Orphan Sunday uh, or some sort of cause. Certainly, if you're kind of a, in the Gen Z uh, young millennial phase in college, you're exposed to lots of opportunity for justice because that generation specifically seems to be pretty in tune. But the, the, the primary questions that I think you hear most frequently is people hear about different plights, different struggles, uh, different areas where there might be inequity or even oppression. And people want to know, what can I do? How can I get involved? Where do I begin to make a difference? And so we barely, just barely scratched the surface and touched on this towards the end of our talk. And I thought, let's take just a few minutes and kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive on how people can really engage in a practical way in pursuing justice and the good of their neighbor. So Kristen, won't you help us? Won't you unpack a little bit more deeply kind of the three areas that you listed uh, that we can take next steps in? Yeah. So the three things that I said is that most of the work focuses on either prevention or intervention or restoration. And none of those three is better than another. And they're all kind of on this continuum. And a lot of organizations will kind of have their hands in all three of those things. Um, but your, your gifting and your even your time and margin that you have in your life may lean towards one of those areas specifically. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of give some different examples of those, but one of the huge blessings of living in Knoxville is something called Compassion Coalition, and we'll link to their website. But Compassion Coalition was actually so instrumental in starting CAFCAM. We went to them and just kind of said, what did you guys do well? What did you not do well? Um, because while CAFCAM is solely adoption and foster care ministries, um, Compassion is all mercy, mercy ministries in Knoxville, which when I think about how much work has gone into CAFCAM and the amount of worth it goes into getting all those people on the same page. It's a huge gift. And so they have some excellent community trainings, things like the cost of poverty experience mm -hmm. where you can actually, it's not the same, but you can actually become a character and you walk through what that would look like in Knoxville um, to be living in poverty and to walk through. Um, and so it gives you compassion and empathy to be able to put that lens on for a little while um, and see what that would look like. Um, and so that's a huge 
starting point. They also have a weekly, um, what they call the bulletin board that they will email to you. And it just goes through list of list of what the needs are, whether that's tangible needs, whether that's somebody that needs to give their time or service. And it's an awesome way just to kind of see all of those things in one place. Yes, Compassion Coalition is an extraordinary organization. If you're in East Tennessee and you're not uh, aware of that, we'll have the link here as well. Uh, as Kristen said, they've got the weekly bulletin, but they also have what's called the Salt and Light Guide in any imaginable mercy ministry, justice pursuit. Uh, they've got the organizations that are active in the East Tennessee area. And uh, so if you're out of East Tennessee, you might be out of luck, but there might be other organizations that you can find that. But Compassion Coalition provides kind of a one-stop shop to find ways that you can get engaged in any of the three steps, but especially this first one, prevention. And one thing we want to encourage people to is Compassion is, is full of faith-based organizations, but as well as civic organizations. And one of the most meaningful things in this work that I'm doing right now is that I partner in four spheres. So I partner with faith leaders, government leaders, business leaders, and creative leaders. And one of the, the richest that has been for me has been our government leaders, because a lot of times our government departments are set up in works of justice. Um, and so it's been really sweet to be able to go in and really form deep relationships with these people who are fighting for justice as well, may or may not know Jesus, but it's just sweet because it helps mend, honestly, some of brokenness. I think that there has been a lot of pain both ways. I think there's been distrust with the local faith community from the government and, and, and vice versa. And so it's, it's kind of sweet to go in there and be able to restore some of those relationships. And that's a really important point in this work is that oftentimes if you're a Christian, when you imagine engaging in kingdom work, God's work, you imagine it in the context of a church or like a parachurch ministry. And if, if you think about uh, the folks in the scripture who we revere, men like Daniel, men like Joseph, they are influential, God-fearing people who bring their influence and their work to government leaders. And they immerse themselves, they integrate themselves into the life. And so, man, I would really encourage you, if you're watching this, uh, and, and maybe you just imagine it, maybe you don't, but maybe just imagine this work happening in, in the Christian sphere, broaden that. And as Kristen said, there's ways to engage that civically with, with government, uh, with other organizations in, in your community. So let's, let's, let's invite all of the people to the tables we can, the more we can work together and the broaden the influence, the better good, uh, we can do for people. So Kristen, so there's, there's intervention, then won't you, or prevention, then won't you talk about the next couple? Yeah. Okay. So from prevention, we move in towards intervention. Um, and these are when we have injustices happening and people are intervening um, in the middle of it. And so I had used the example of foster care yesterday, but that also includes um, people like Centro Hispano and, and Bridges Ministry, Street Hope. Um, and Restoration House, there are a lot of people that are intervening in different people's vulnerable lives. And, and one of the things I encourage you, there are so many people that I have discouraged from starting a nonprofit. Um, and starting a nonprofit is not a bad thing. Please hear me say that. There are times and spaces to do that. But especially in the East Tennessee region, we have a lot of people doing good work. And so I would really encourage you, if you can, find some people that are like-minded um, and and really plug in and don't reinvent the wheel um, to what they're already doing. One of the things that's really sweet in our world is through people like um, Susanna's house, who is working with um, mothers who are using drugs while pregnant. And so there's a program with the state that they don't necessarily have to go the children don't have to go straight into foster care if they commit to working through these programs. And so ideally the, the farther on the front end that we can catch them, the better. Um, and in places like um, Hope Resource Center um, that are intervening when in these mother's lives, um, many times young women um, and intervening and really loving them and, and walking them through a healthy pregnancy as much as possible. And, just to kind of give a quick rundown, Kristen gave several different ways that you can get involved 
in justice and mercy here in the Knoxville community in a broad spectrum. Centro Hispano is our, our advocates for our uh, Latino and Latina uh, neighbors. Uh, Bridges connects and serves refugee populations. Restoration House helps women who uh, have been uh, are in vulnerable spots for multiple reasons. Street Hope um, provides restoration, hope, education, and reemergence for those who have been caught in human trafficking. You mentioned Susanna's House and then Hope Resource Center for those who are in crisis pregnancy. Several different ways that you can get involved in meaningful work, specifically in uh, the kind of the four categories that the scripture gives us, the orphan, the widow, the poor, and, and the immigrant, the foreigner, the, the racially oppressed individual uh, right here in our community. If you're outside of your community, it, you know, you have Google. All right. So you can go and, and look and find different ways that you can get involved. So pre prevention is kind of that relief uh, that we offer. Intervention helps us get in the middle where uh, the, the, a, a divergent pathway is forming one towards destitution in and we want to try to get in there and lead towards a path towards restoration, which is the, the last one. So let's talk a little bit about what restoration work looks like. Yeah, it's really sweet to see restoration because a lot of our places are intervening, but then they are moving towards that restoration piece. And so that's not just pulling people out and saying, see, yeah, I hope, I hope life goes well. <laughs> because if we look at even this is kind of getting into science, but even studies of the brain, what happens is we lay these pathways of patterns that we do over and over and over and again. You pull someone out, but you don't offer a new pathway for them. They're going to go back to that old pattern over, and they may still go back to that old pattern over and over and over again. One of the most eye-opening things that I learned in nursing school is that for victims of domestic violence, they typically return to their abuser about seven times before they can finally make that huge break. And so that restoration piece is huge of teaching those new patterns over and over and over and over again. Um, and so that might be um, job mentoring where you're teaching someone how to write a resume and how to do a job interview and how to set an alarm to show up on time and, and things that may seem very um, basic to you. But I was talking to a former foster youth the other day about writing down um, a list and kind of prioritizing it as far as like what's the most important thing and that's something they had never heard of before well if you've never heard of that before it's easy to get off track um and so investing in that also um street hope who is one of y'all's newer partners at fellowship Mississippi, and and really has has um started to get traction across the whole um state because they are going getting ready to open the first safe home for domestic minor sex trafficking um victims uh, for females. And so there's going to need to be a lot of restorative work. There's going to be foster parents that are going to be specifically trained to work with that population. There's going to be medical professionals, counselors, there's going to need to be volunteers that come um, into this, to this private safe home. And so there's going to be a lot of restorative work and knowing that, I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday, but we tend to be people that are want a quick fix. Um, and a lot of restorative justice work is a long haul. Um, and that doesn't mean that you may be in the same place serving forever, but it does mean that trusting that the seeds that you sow um, will one day bear fruit, maybe not in your lifetime, but just being faithful to, to lay those seeds down now um, and, and trusting that the Lord will water them and that they may grow later on. Um, but it's not a quick, it's not a quick work. It's not, but it is a beautiful thing when you see someone travel through all three phases after our teaching yesterday. And, and this wasn't necessarily planned, but one of our uh, technical workers who's now part-time on staff with our church, I mean, a decade ago, he was homeless, addicted to drugs, and connected with one of our local ministries here in town, Knoxville Area Rescue Ministries, got off the streets, got healthy, went through all the different programming, uh, prevention, intervention, and then through restoration. Another way to think about it is relief, um, restore, reform, and then today, full, full cycle, and actually going back to where he began to help others on their journey. And Kristen, one of the things you said I think is really important, I just want to highlight, is we can't do it all. Andy Stanley uh, is an author and pastor. He has this saying that I think is really helpful 
uh, when it comes to justice work. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And some of you might be watching this. You might be a young mom with three kids and you're homeschooling or you're carpool schooling and you've got uh, a full life and you, and you might not be able to have either the resources, the expertise or the time to take on everything, but you can do something. You can carve out some space, even if it's just uh, getting involved with your local homeless ministry by you know providing necessary supplies. And then in different seasons of life where resources or time grow, investing more, or just even being obedient to when God gives you those free, uh, free windows. And the truth is, the reason the church needs to rise up is because no one of us can do all of this, but all of us together doing something can make a significant difference. And, and, and when we make that difference, not only do we help others, but we really do bring uh, God glory and give the church a great witness when we invest in these ways. Kristen, uh, before we kind of wrap up, what are maybe some other recommended resources? What are some good books or podcasts? What are some other things that maybe people want to take a little deeper dive in a particular area? Anything come to mind that you might want to recommend? You, if you'll recommend a couple, then I'll jump in as well. Some of the podcasts that I'm listening to right now and for the past couple of years have been Be the Bridge and Truth's Table. Um, Truth's Table is, is by three black women who share on their perspective of things going on in the world. And then I love the book, When Helping Hurts. It can be really applicable to every marginalized population. That's great. A couple of things that uh, come to mind, particularly in the racial reconciliation or justice uh, world, is uh, a great book by Trilla Nubel called uh, United. And it's really about how Christians and the churches can pursue a vision for diversity. I would encourage anyone who hasn't ever read kind of the, maybe not the first, but one of the most significant uh, documents in, in history, and that's MLK's uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. And then there's a series of reflections about that letter called Letters to a Birmingham Jail that include contributions from uh, some of uh, really kind of our modern um, civil rights leaders and thinkers. Uh, so there's just there's a ton of great information out there. We'll pro provide a few other resources uh, in kind of the show notes so that you can take some next steps. Kristen, this is an important uh, work for you. Like This is personal. It's also professional, but it's also a, a significant part of who you are as a follower of Jesus. Um, any last words to those who might be watching this and, you know, God stirring them uh, to get more active in, uh, in this, this obedient pursuit of justice in the world? Yeah, I think I said it at the beginning of our talk yesterday, but I really do feel like you miss out on a huge piece of who God is and what he's doing in our world when we, when we don't engage in this work. And I have learned so much about who he is and how much he loves us um, by doing this. And it's just sweet to sit in church and be taught Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And, and I really can kind of bring it back to every single person wants to know that they belong somewhere. Um, and I feel like underneath all of this justice work is really just this soft reminder of like, you belong Hmm. to the family of God. Um, and I know that kind of sounds, I don't know what it sounds like, maybe, maybe cheesy, but it really is this underlying theme of like really validating people and who the Lord created them to be. Um, and really that's all that work is, is really driving back to. That's so good. It's such a reminder. One of the most beautiful portraits of what Christians believe the gospel to be is in the picture of adoption. Matter of fact, that's how the Apostle Paul articulates the picture of saving faith, uh, oftentimes in the New Testament, especially in the New Testament letter of Ephesians, that even though we, we were spiritually orphaned, uh, God adopted us, not because we were special or we showed some measure of uh, potential, but it was an act of grace, and that is the root of justice work. We're not looking for people whom we feel have met some metric of deserving, but rather we are emulating and mirroring the life of Jesus in the world around us, where people are valuable, not because of what they can offer us, but because of who their maker is. They're created with the image of God. His value and dignity has been stamped in their soul. And God has called us where their things are broken, 
uh, where there is oppression to be restores and uh, freedom makers for those people. Kristen, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for your work uh, in our East Tennessee area, especially with vulnerable children. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Fireside Chats with Brad. I mean, if this was helpful to you, take a moment, share it with a friend. Love to see you next time. So take care.